On the morning of September 25th, 1978, Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 182 collided with a private Cessna light aircraft over San Diego, California. All 137 passengers and crew aboard both planes, and a further seven people on the ground, lost their lives in the accident. It is the deadliest air disaster in California history. Flight 182, a Boeing 727, was en route from Los Angeles International Airport. At 8.59 a.m., air traffic control alerted the PSA crew to a nearby Cessna 172 Skyhawk aircraft. The pilot of the Cessna was pursuing his instrument rating certification. Due to this, he wore a hood that restricted his peripheral vision, which is normal in instrument flight training. Air traffic control advised the PSA crew that the Cessna, flying northeast, was at a distance of one mile. The crew reported seeing the Cessna, then reported that they had lost visual contact. After receiving permission to land, and about 40 seconds prior to the collision, the PSA flight crew continued to act confused regarding the Cessna's whereabouts. Despite the captain's comment that the Cessna was probably behind us, it was, in fact, directly in front of and below Flight 182. The PSA flight was descending and rapidly closing in on the Cessna, which had now deviated from its assigned course. According to the report issued by the National Transportation Safety Board, the PSA pilots may have had difficulty seeing the Cessna as its colours blended in with the roofs on the houses in the neighbourhood below. For some reason, Flight 182's crew never officially alerted the tower that they had lost sight of the Cessna. If they had, the collision might not have occurred. Also, if the Cessna had not deviated from its air traffic control assigned bearing of 70 degrees, instead of turning to 90 degrees, the collision may have been avoided. The NTSB estimated that the planes would have missed each other by about 1,000 feet, 300 meters, instead of colliding. Regardless, the report stated that it was the responsibility of the Boeing jet to comply with the requirement to pass well clear of the Cessna. The PSA plane overtook the Cessna, which was now directly below it, both roughly on a 90 degree due east heading. The collision occurred at about 2700 feet, or 790 meters. According to several witnesses on the ground, first they heard a loud metallic crunching sound, then an explosion. Staff photographer Hans Rent of the San Diego County Public Relations Office was attending an outdoor press event on the morning of the accident and took two photographs of the falling 727, its right wing on fire. Flight 182's right wing was heavily damaged and on fire due to its ruptured fuel tank. This rendered the plane uncontrollable and sent it into a sharp right-hand bank. As the plane fell out of the sky, the following conversation could be heard in the cockpit. Flight 182 struck a house at 3611 Niles Street, 3 miles, 5 kilometers, northeast of San Diego's Lindbergh Field Airport, in a North Park residential neighborhood. It then impacted the driveway at 300 miles an hour, 480 kilometers an hour, nose down, while banked 50 degrees to the right. One of the plane's wings lodged in a nearby house. The crash of Flight 182 created a mushroom cloud that could be seen for miles. The severity of the impact meant that the plane's engines, tail section and landing gear were among the few recognisable parts remaining. However, 
the impact and debris area was relatively small due to the plane's steep nose-down angle. At the time, it was the deadliest aircraft accident in the United States, until eight months later when American Airlines Flight 191 crashed with the loss of 273 lives. The National Transportation Safety Board report determined that the probable cause of the collision was the failure of the PSA flight's crew to follow proper air traffic control procedures. Its crew lost sight of the Cessna despite instructions to keep visual separation from that traffic and did not alert the tower that they could no longer see the aircraft. As a result of this and other mid-air collisions, the Traffic Collision Alert and Avoidance System, or TCAS, is now installed on all commercial passenger aircraft. This system gives pilots an audible warning of approaching traffic and directs pilots to either ascend or descend to prevent a collision. A memorial plaque honoring those who died in the disaster is located in the San Diego Aerospace Museum. On the afternoon of May 25, 1979, American Airlines Flight 191 crashed shortly after takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. All 258 passengers and 13 crew on board, along with two people on the ground, were killed in the accident. With a total of 273 fatalities, the crash is the deadliest aviation accident in US history. The aircraft, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, was on a scheduled flight to Los Angeles International Airport when the accident occurred. As the aircraft approached takeoff speed, engine number one detached from the left wing of the plane, taking a 3 foot or 0.9 meter section of the wing's leading edge along with it. Robert Graham, supervisor of maintenance for American Airlines, stated, As the aircraft got closer, I noticed what appeared to be vapor or smoke of some type coming from the leading edge of the wing and the number one engine pylon. I noticed that the number one engine was bouncing up and down quite a bit. Once the aircraft started rotation, the engine came off, went up over the top of the wing, and rolled back down onto the runway. The aircraft continued a fairly normal climb until it started a turn to the left, and at that point, I thought he was going to come back to the airport. What was said in the cockpit in the final 50 seconds of the flight was not known as the cockpit voice recorder lost power when the engine detached. In addition to the failure of the engine, several related systems failed. The detached engine's hydraulic system was damaged, but still operational. The electrical systems powered by engine one also failed, causing many systems to go offline, including the captain's instrument panel and stick shaker. The aircraft climbed to about 325 feet or 100 meters above the ground, while releasing a trail of fuel and hydraulic fluid from the left wing. The failure of the left engine's hydraulic system meant that the wing slats were locked in place. As a result, the left wing stalled, causing the aircraft to bank to the left, at an angle of 112 degrees. The aircraft impacted the ground in a field around 4,600 feet or 1,400 meters from the end of the runway. Large sections of debris were hurled into a nearby trailer park, destroying five trailers and several cars. The plane had also crashed into a nearby aircraft hangar. It was completely destroyed by the impact and the ignition of 21,000 gallons, 79,500 liters of fuel. No sizable components other than the engine and tail section remained. In addition to the 271 people on board Flight 191, two employees at a nearby repair garage were also killed, and two more were severely burned. Witnesses to the crash confirmed that the plane had not struck any debris on the runway. Investigators concluded that the accident must have been caused by some form of structural failure. The National Transportation Safety Board determined that the left engine's pylon had been damaged during an earlier engine change at the airline's maintenance facility, only months before the disaster. Standard engine removal procedure recommended by McDonnell Douglas called for the engine to be detached from the pylon first before finally removing the pylon from the wing. However, 
American Airlines, along with other airlines, had developed a time-saving procedure that would remove both the engine and pylon as a single unit. This removal method involved using a large forklift. Positioning of the forklift had to be extremely accurate. If it was out of position, structural damage to the wing could occur. This element of risk was compounded by a shift change that occurred during the removal. The normal loss of hydraulic pressure due to the shutdown of the forklift's engine caused a misalignment between the engine unit and the wing. This misalignment, while not enough to cause immediate structural failure, caused fatigue cracking that developed further over each takeoff and landing over the two months leading up to the crash, until the attachment finally failed. The NTSB determined that the loss of engine and the damage to the wing's leading edge should not have been enough to cause the crash. The report stated that the pilots should have been able to return the plane to the airport using its remaining two engines. However, the DC-10, unlike other planes, relied on hydraulic fluid to maintain the airflow over the wing. As the engine severed the hydraulic fluid lines, the resulting loss of pressure led to the wing's stall. The procedure of removing both the engine and pylon as a single unit was banned. Despite the drop-in reputation, the DC-10 continued to have a long career as a passenger and cargo aircraft. A memorial to the victims of the crash was finally dedicated in 2011. On February the 4th, 2015, TransAsia Airways Flight 235 clipped the Huandong Viaduct in Taipei, Taiwan, before crashing into the Keelung River below. The plane had just taken off, and now it was in the river. The plane, an ATR-72, departed Taipei's Songshan Airport at 10.52am local time, bound for Kinmen Airport in Taiwan. Shortly after takeoff, a fault in the number 2 engine caused it to shut down. However, the flight crew misdiagnosed the problem, and instead shut off the still functioning number 1 engine at an altitude of 1,630 feet, 500 meters. With both engines shut off, the plane entered a steep bank at nearly 90 degrees to the left as it descended. After narrowly clearing an apartment building, it continued towards the Huandong viaduct. As the plane flew over the viaduct, its left wingtip struck a Volkswagen taxi traveling in the westbound lane, injuring the two occupants. The rest of the wing then clipped the viaduct's guardrail, breaking it off. The aircraft then crashed into the Keelung River below, breaking into two pieces. Of the 58 passengers and crew aboard, only 15 would survive. Within minutes of the crash, fire department, military and volunteer rescue workers were at the scene. Survivors, located mainly in the rear of the wreckage, were rescued and ferried to shore in inflatable boats. Divers were forced to cut the seatbelts of the dead passengers in order to recover their bodies, a task made all the more difficult by the poor visibility underwater. The aircraft's flight recorders were recovered shortly after 4pm and sent to the Taiwanese Aviation Safety Council. Analysis of the data showed that just 37 seconds after takeoff, the aircraft's right engine triggered an alarm. Although the flight crew reported an engine flameout, Data showed that the engine had in fact been moved to idle power, which failed to provide enough thrust to the propeller. The ASC issued its preliminary report on July 2nd. It stated that the still functioning engine number one was incorrectly shut down by the pilot following the failure of the right engine. The pilot had previously failed a simulator test in 2014 for being unable to handle an engine flameout during takeoff. He later passed the test the following month. The final version of the report, released in July 2016, stated that the following events occurred. Following the flameout of the right engine, the pilot reduced power and subsequently shut down the other working engine. The flight crew failed to properly identify the malfunction, causing the pilot to become confused. The loss of engine power during the initial climb generated a series of stall warnings, including activation of the stick shaker. The flight crew, however, did not respond to these warnings in a timely manner. The loss of power from both engines was not detected and corrected by the crew in order to restart the left engine. 
the aircraft finally stalled during an attempted restart at an altitude from which it could not recover control. Flight crew coordination and communication were less than effective, and compromised the safety of the flight. Both pilots failed to gather relevant data from each other regarding the status of both engines. TransAsia Airways offered compensation of US$475,000 to the family of each victim. The disaster, the airline's second fatal accident in seven months, resulted in the airline ceasing operations and it shut down indefinitely on November 22nd, 2016. On August 28th, 1988, around 300,000 fans gathered at the Rammstein US Air Force Base in West Germany to watch an air show featuring the Italian Air Force. During the performance, however, a mid-air collision resulted in what was, at the time, the deadliest air show disaster in history. With the onset of the Cold War, growing tensions with the Soviet Union forced the United States to move their air presence away from East Germany. As part of the NATO expansion plan, France agreed to provide Air Force Base sites in their zone of occupation in Rhineland Palatinate. Construction began on the Rammstein Air Force Base near Kaiserslautern in 1949 and it opened on June 1, 1953. Created in 1961, the Italian Air Force's aerobatic demonstration team, the Frecce Tricolori, or Tricolor Arrows, consisted of 10 pilots. While only the best pilots were considered for membership, the team got off to a rocky start, suffering four accidents in their first year. One of the highlights of their performance was the pierced heart maneuver, where two groups of planes would fly in opposite directions to form a heart. Another aircraft would then pierce the heart. During the afternoon of August 28, 1988, the Frecce Tricolori performed this stunt at the end of the air show. As planned, the two heart forming groups passed each other. However, the heart piercing aircraft, known as Pony 10, came in too low and too fast. It collided with the lead plane, Pony 1, destroying its tail section. Pony 1 then spiraled out of control, colliding with another plane, Pony 2. Pony 1's pilot ejected, but was killed as he hit the runway before his parachute could open. His plane then collided with the medevac helicopter situated on a nearby taxiway, killing its pilot. Pony 2 then crashed beside the runway, exploding into a fireball, killing its pilot on impact. The plane that caused the accident, Pony 10, continued across the runway in flames towards the spectators and crashed into the grandstand. Less than seven seconds elapsed between the time of the initial impact and the collision with the grandstand, leaving spectators little time to escape. The disaster revealed serious shortcomings in the handling of large-scale emergency procedures by both German civil and American military authorities. U.S. military personnel did not immediately allow German ambulances onto the base, as a necessary permission had to be granted. To make matters worse, it wasn't until an hour after the accident that enough ambulances had arrived to treat the injured. While American helicopters and ambulances provided the quickest means of evacuating burn victims, they lacked sufficient capacities for treating them while in transit to hospital. One paramedic at the scene stated, at the time we arrived shortly after 5 o'clock, there were no injured people, no more. We could see that the last badly injured people were loaded into American helicopters. We could see some pickup trucks with injured people transporting them away. It was not possible to find an officer in charge, a director of operations, or even a contact person. So we got to the hospital by our own initiative. Asking several action forces, paramedics, police officers, nobody could name a director of operations. I was asking for a managing paramedic of the operation to coordinate the evacuation, but there was none. In the aftermath of the disaster, an investigation was undertaken to determine the cause. Video footage from spectators showed that Pony 10, the piercing aircraft, had come in too low and too fast, but could not determine why. The collision was attributed to pilot error. In all, three pilots and 67 spectators were killed in the disaster. Two memorials were erected in honour of the victims. One open to the public outside the base, and another inside the base itself. 
On July 25, 2000, Air France Concorde Flight 4590 crashed shortly after taking off from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. The accident claimed the lives of all 109 passengers and crew on board, along with an additional four people on the ground. The crash was the only fatal Concorde accident during the plane's 27-year history. The Concorde, purchased by Air France in 1976, was powered by four Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, each equipped with afterburners. The aircraft's last scheduled repair had occurred just four days before the crash. No problems had been reported during the repair. The flight, en route to John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York, was chartered by the German company Peter Delman Cruises. Passengers were on their way to board the cruise ship MS Deutschland for a 16-day cruise to Ecuador. Five minutes before the Concorde's scheduled takeoff, Continental Airlines Flight 55, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, took off from the same runway. During takeoff, a small titanium alloy strip that was a part of the engine cover fell off and landed on the tarmac. During its takeoff run, the Concorde ran over this debris, cutting its right front tire, sending a large chunk of tire debris into the underside of its left wing at an estimated speed of 140 meters per second, or 310 miles per hour. Although the impact did not puncture any of the fuel tanks in the wing, it sent a shockwave that ruptured fuel tank number 5 at its weakest point, just above the undercarriage. The ruptured tank released large quantities of fuel, while tire fragments severed wiring in the landing gear bay, preventing the retraction of the landing gear. Fuel from the ruptured tank ignited, causing a loss of power in both engines 1 and 2. Engine 1 slowly recovered over the next few seconds. A large plume of fire developed, and the flight engineer shut down engine 2 in response to the fire warning. This lack of thrust, increased drag from the damaged landing gear, and fire damage to the flight controls made the plane impossible to control. Just two minutes after takeoff, the plane crashed into a hotel in nearby Gonesse, killing four people on the ground and injuring a further six. Air traffic control on the ground noticed the flames and informed the flight crew before the plane was airborne. However, the plane had exceeded V1 speed. V1 speed is a speed at which it is deemed too unsafe to abort the takeoff. As a result of the damage, the Concorde was unable to gain enough airspeed and unable to climb or accelerate and its speed decreased during its brief flight. With engine 2 shut down, engine 1 surged in power again, causing the right wing to lift. This caused the plane to bank at an angle of over 100 degrees. The crew reduced power in engines 3 and 4 in an attempt to level the aircraft, but the plane continued its deceleration until it finally stalled. Air France Flight 4590 crashed into the Hotel Lissimo Le Relais Bleu Hotel. A video of the burning plane on takeoff and the aftermath of the crash was captured on video by a passing motorist. The crew tried to divert to nearby Paris Le Bourget Airport. However, accident investigators determined that a safe landing would have been unlikely due to the plane's flight path. The Concorde's cockpit voice recorder recorded the last intelligible words in the cockpit. Until the crash, Concorde had been considered one of the safest airplanes in the world. The crash was a direct cause of the end of Concorde's illustrious career. Within days of the crash, all Air France Concords were grounded as a result of the accident, pending an investigation into the cause of the crash. Although British Airways claimed to make a profit on its fleet of Concords, Air France's operation had been a money-losing venture, 
and it was claimed that the airplane was kept in operation only as a source of national pride. The accident investigation concluded that the Concorde was over the maximum takeoff weight by 810 kilograms or 1,790 pounds. The wear strip that fell off the Continental DC-10 had been replaced twice in the months leading up to the accident. It had neither been manufactured nor installed according to the procedures set out by the manufacturer. A monument in honour of the crash victims was erected at Gonesse. The Concorde fleet was retired by both British Airways and Air France in 2003.